What would you describe as the main reasons for the uprising in It's not the first uprising. I mean, we've had m multiple uprisings in the past. It's just they've, they've gone unnoticed. Uh, this is the first one where the uprising has uh, taken uh, quite a huge effect, uh, especially in the capital in Baghdad, because the, uh, the, pro the protesters had taken over uh, two and now today I heard three of the most uh, important uh, bridges in Baghdad. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Uh, but basically, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the 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 situation has always been since the since the invasion of the U.S. Uh, forces onto Iraq in 2003. We've always had uh, problems with corruption. Uh, Iranian interference in the government, in the politics, uh, uh, it then became uh, more uh, aggressive. So uh, militias uh, were formed. Uh, these were, these militias were they were called. I don't know if you remember the stories of the death squads. I remember Channel Four in the in the UK ran stories, documentaries about the death squads uh, that were being run. Uh, and it was sectarian death squad. So they were going out, they were, they were killing all sorts of uh, um, um, Sunnis at the time uh, because they were backed by Iranian Shiites and, and so on. So they've, the Iranians have been playing a huge role in disrupting um, uh, Iraq and uh, not giving it any chance or any hope of ever advancing. So um, and the, and this was un, unfortunately this was under the eyes of the United States. So the United States knew, um, for example, that the Iranians were uh, present, that the Iranians were uh, conducting even attacks against the the American forces. Uh, can't remember the general that was uh, became the CIA head and then was kicked out because he had a relationship or something. What was his name? He was the head of. Remember. Sorry, you're on mute. I said, gosh, I'm forgetting the name as well, but uh, I can yeah. pull it later. But, yeah, but um, you know, you know who I'm referring to. But even then, there was a re there were reports, and I think he um, during a, uh, I think it was a, a congressional uh, hearing or, or Senate hearing or something like that. He was giving evidence against uh, how Iran was running the show, basically in Iraq. Uh, with their militias, uh, bombing all sorts of targets uh, for the U.S. forces, as well as uh, locals, uh, displacements uh, of, of Sunnis and Shiites in different areas, uh, just wrecking havoc across the country. And this was back in 2004, 2005. And then we had the eruption of the sectarian war in 2006, which laid waste to most of the country. So that went to 2006, 2007, all the way up to, I think, 2010, uh, where constant car bombs and uh, was just all over the place. But nothing was done then. And I've spoken about this before. I mean, one of the reasons, for example, that I, I was disappointed as uh, to what the U.S. did was they, they basically, they invaded based on the false WMD nonsense at, at the time it was. Um, but they, they, they broke Iraq and they, they just left it. They, they, they left it and, and on the contrary, they, they gave it to Iran on a gold, uh, golden plate and they completely disregarded all the consequences afterwards. And of course the consequences afterwards were um, uh, Al-Qaeda came in. We never had Al-Qaeda. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, of Saddam or the previous regime either, but uh, give credit where credit is due. Uh, he wasn't sectarian. He was secular. He, we never had, he was very high on, um, you know, security and all that. So we never had Al Qaeda. We never had ISIS. We never had anyone go off in terms of radicalism, uh, radicalism and so on and so forth. But that was his sort of his police state and that, how he sort of did things. Now, a lot of people disagreed with that. But again, it kept the country, at least in that sense, safe internally. Um, when Bremer came in and the U.S. forces, of course, and so on and so forth, all that just went out the, the, uh, the window. And so we were left with basically nothing. And then the, the United States decided just to, to, to leave. 
and I was one of the people that was calling on the U.S. forces to leave, uh, and that we would pick up this, you know, the the situation afterwards. We we the, the Iraqi people should be able to fix it ourselves. But I'd never thought that they would give it away to the Iranians just like that. They had already known that Iranian people who were involved. I mean, there were there were instances. For example, there was one person who was involved. He was, he was a terrorist. He was on the U.S. watch list because he was involved in the terrorist attack attack. Uh, on the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait in 1985 or 86. I can't remember what the name, the name is, but I can probably Google it. That person was sitting as, a, as an Iraqi parliamentarian, and he was Iranian, wanted as a terrorist, under the noses of the Iraqi government and the U.S. forces, and the U.S. government then, and no one did anything about it. So you then start to think, okay, so who's working with who and what's going on, actually? It's not, this doesn't make any sense anymore. And then when Bush left and Obama came, we were hopeful that Obama would see the light and, you know, he'd bring some sort of stability. And his ineptness was just absolute. So he immediately took out all the forces, left Iraq as is, and Iran just came in and took everything all over. And I agree with Trump, even though I can't stand the, uh, the man. When he comes and says, you know, who created uh, uh, ISIS? Uh, Obama, well, yeah, because Obama just left, so there's nothing left, and you knew your the CIA is the, the you know one of the biggest embassies in the in the region is the Iraq is the U.S. embassy in uh, uh, in Baghdad with a huge CIA presence there. You didn't know what was going on. How how could you not know what was going? On? How did you how did you not foresee the, the what were the consequences? And so ISIS then came into play. They took over the entire north. They went through. You know, the, the people went through all hell. So we went through war after, uh, after that we had Al-Qaeda. After that we had ISIS. And it's, con it's continuous. And then there's, there's no, there's, and I think, I think there's just fatigue, uh, Iraqi fatigue from the West that nobody wants to bother anymore with this story because it's just a, you know, it's a death story. They just can't, there's no end to it. But because the reason why there's no end to it is because no one put any, resolution to, to end the situation there. There were all sorts of cures as to what should be done, but no one took the, the, the effort to do anything. And so it's now left to the people and the protesters. So the protesters, I mean, even the United Nations, um, nothing has come out of the United Nations. And on social media, the, the person who's in charge, the, I think she's Swedish, the person that's in charge of the UN mission there has been hammered with uh, the Iraqi social media as one, uh, you know, she's, she's, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, a culprit of, of what's going on. She's, she's, uh, uh, part of the, part of the broken system, uh, no rights, double standards. And yes, double standards. When I look at the news, for example, I see constant coverage of Hong Kong, rightly so, but I see zero coverage of Iraq. So at the moment, Hong Kong has lost one life. Iraqis have lost at least 500 in the last month with about 15,000 wounded, pictures of which are live pictures of people being killed while protesting live, but nothing has been shown on the, 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 uh, uh, the, the media. And that's shocking. Well, I would have to say the same for the Iran protests right now, yeah, which, you, which you would think the Trump administration would actually be lifting up right now. And we turn on absolutely. CNN, nothing, nothing. nothing, nothing whatsoever. So that makes absolutely no sense. I would have thought, and I sent a tweet the other day to uh, onto Trump's account saying, out of all the people, I would have thought you'd be the one to sit there and say, aha. This is a golden opportunity because Obama, because he does everything against Obama. So whatever Obama did or didn't do, he tries to do the opposite. So Obama failed to support the Green Revolution in Iran in, I think it was 2010 or 11. When was it? I can't remember what it was. I would have thought this would be a golden opportunity to support the Iranians to get rid of this regime without going through war, but at least to support them. And to say, look, you think we'd get these smug, like, look, my sanctions are working, the people are rising up. And you'd think the same with, with Iraq, that he would say, look at the mess that Obama created, you know, those smug Trump tweets. And, yeah. Exactly. 
it's my turn now to show you how Trump is, is going to make this into a golden era for, for the entire region. Where is that? But no, it's, 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 it's just, it's mind boggling. The, the, like I said, the double standards, the media and, and the, the weakness. It's like a sacred cow that they don't want to touch anymore. Why, wouldn't, why don't you want to touch the, the, why are you concentrating on Hong Kong? Is it because there's an agenda against China and the trade wars and so on and so forth and so you want to pressure China? That's the reason why you're looking at Hong Kong? Right, please, so it's fine. I don't, I don't mind that, but you have to be fair with everyone else. Well, uh, they're, not, they're not looking at the, the, the situation in, in South America. I know you ladies are, are involved in, in South America. Nobody's looking at Chile, nobody's looking, it doesn't make sense. Well, what really doesn't make sense is not looking at Iran because like with China, there's an agenda. And I, I have no understanding or comprehension of what is behind that, why Trump isn't you know, saying what a terrible repressive regime, look, I told you, and anyway. The quick solution for, for everyone in the region, because if you, if you look at, the, if you look at the, the situation in the entire region, Iraq is firstly uh, uh, affected because it's a neighboring country. Then you have Syria after that, and then you have Lebanon with Hezbollah and all that, and then you have Yemen. All these four countries are directly linked with Iran and the re Iranian regime, not the Iranian people, but the Iranian regime. So the, the best solution would be a regime change for Iran, which frees up Iran itself and these all uh, uh, other four countries. I, it, it's 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 a. I mean, when they when they want to change things, it seems they'll go to the ends to do so. Uh, but I don't know when it doesn't suit their needs. And I would, again, like you said, I would have thought Trump because he tore off the. The agreement and isn't happy and wants to continue sanctions and so on and so forth. The continuation of sanctions has had not much of an effect until recently, but the continuation of the sanctions because Iran has been relying on Iraq for all the, the funding it needed for the last from 2003 onwards. So $1.5 trillion have been either siphoned off to Iran or corruptly stolen away from the Iraqis. So when people ask and say, well, why are the, the, the people cheering? And most of the people there, of course, uh, are Shiites. They're not Sunnis. So the Sunnis have sort of stood aside so that they're not labeled as Ba'athist or old Ba'athist or Saddamis or whatever it may be. So they don't want to ruin the situation. And the Shiites understand that. Shiite Arabs understand it. They're like, and they're happy to go ahead with that. But the support is, is overwhelming. It's nationwide, even from the Kurdish areas. They're supporting uh, the the uh, the uprising uh, and the protests, uh, but that the thing they haven't been able to, to label anything uh, on it because it's it's mostly Shiite, so you can't say anything about it. And uh, the, the the government itself has used Iranians. I mean, the, there was a report today, I think, on Reuters to say uh, the snipers uh, that have been killing the protesters have turned out to be Iranians. We've been saying that all along. The Iraqis have come out. Iraqi soldiers have come out saying, we're not shooting at you. We're just holding the lines. We're not shooting at you. The SWAT teams have come back and said the same thing. We're not shooting at you. They stood with the, uh, the protesters saying, we understand. We're part of the, the, the society. We know and we want to change as well. They're not shooting at you. So the questions from the start, from the first few days when the killing started, everyone started pointing the fingers to Iran. And then they caught a number of Iranians ID cards and Iranians, and uh, they basically killed them off, but they, they, that was proof, and they had videotaped them, and uh, it was there, and then they attacked the Iranian consulate and uh, some of the, the uh, pro-Iranian um, uh, parties that we have in, in the government. They've attacked those, and they burned those down. So there's a direct link of the oppression that's having uh, and the silence from the government, uh, the Iraqi government, to the protesters and their demands because of the Iranian influence. And nothing is going to change unless that chokehold is released. There's, there's nothing. And the, the, the people are going to continue to, to do what they do. And they've been managing to do a brilliant job. You know, it's, uh, it's fantastic how they've been managing that. There, there's been all overwhelming support. Uh, people have been sending all sorts of money down to, to support them. 
uh, from the simplest things. I mean, even doctors uh, and nurses, they've, they've camped out. I don't know if you've seen the pictures on social media. They've camped out near the protester areas so that when they're injured, they're immediately rushed there uh, and they're, they're, they're supported there. And, uh, and even with that, it seems that we've had now a number of cases where uh, on social media, if they find uh, doctors or people that are helping them unmasked, uh, those people have been kidnapped. And some have ended up dead and some have been unfortunately tortured and all. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of that. So people are trying to, 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 to you know, to, to stay as, as protected as possible, but then this is the situation that they're, that they're living in. Could you talk a little bit about um, what exactly the protesters are protesting? I mean, we hear it as, um, you know, the broad issues, mismanagement, corruption, inflation, but uh, some of the more specifics about economic life and, um, yeah, what they're protesting for. So the, the, uh, the situation for the Iraqi population at the moment is there, there's no employment, non-existent. Um, the infrastructure is completely dismantled. There's still, the, there's no electricity. There's no clean water. Uh, communications is a mess. Uh, education is, is completely uh, non-existent in a sense. I mean, people have to do makeshift classrooms and things like that to be able to, uh, to hold classes, proper classes and things. Um, and it's all around uh, north and south, uh, no matter where you are, uh, nationwide, it's the same. Uh, hospitals are in dire straits. Um, uh, medicines are extremely expensive. Uh, so there are all sorts of basic necessities that people are just not finding. And then you've got about 95 million, I'm sorry, 95 billion uh, of oil revenues coming into the country on a yearly basis, you know? In comparison, for example, if, if you look at an, a, a country that's next door, which is for example, Jordan, Iraq has a population of 30 some million. Jordan has a population of about eight or so million. So about a third, let's say, 30, a, a, a bit more. Um, Jordan lives on a, on a budget of 8 billion and Iraq is getting 95 billion, of which Jordan is at a very high standard, whereas the poverty in Iraq the unemployment in Iraq, the social services, everything is non-existent. So you see the money, you see all that money is just, it's just coming and going and no one sees where it's at. So the protesters have been demanding that it's not a change in government anymore. The whole structure needs to be taken out. There's just no room for it anymore. Uh, any change in parties will not do. So parties are not, uh, uh, especially the, the, the religious parties um, uh, are, are uh, deemed as corrupt as anything else. So none of them are needed and wanted anymore. Under the circumstance, under the current circumstances that we have, the, 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 because of the Iranian influence in the country, you can't hold uh, proper elections. The elections have been rigged a number of times for a number of years. And one of the recent ones, if I go back, Say in 2010, if I, if I bring this as an example, in 2010, I remember Ayad Alawi uh, and his party won the majority. But because he was opposed to Iran, he wasn't uh, allowed to uh, 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 create a government. And because Iran, Iran wanted Nuri Maliki to continue, he did. And so, Ayad Alawi conceded, even though he had the majority seats, he conceded the, the uh, uh, prime ministership to Nuri Maliki to continue with his party, his Dawa party, and things continued as is. And then after that, we've had Haider Abadi and we had this, uh, the, the, the new one that came in. So all the changes are reflected. So nothing, and, and you speak to the people on the streets and they'll say, if you, tell, if you tell them, if you come back and you say, well, Iraq is democracy now because America brought in the democracy. No, it's not a democracy. 
it's, it's being rigged and everyone knows it. There were all sorts of videos on social media the last election with all sorts of infringements. They were bringing in, they, they caught containers worth of uh, ballots, already filled in ballots coming in from Iran, already printed and coming in from Iran, and that was caught. Government didn't do anything about no investigation. They said they're going to investigate, nothing. That's always the case. We're going to investigate in the future and we'll see what's going to happen, and nothing goes. It dies out after X number of months. But the people never forgot. So when you come back and you say, well, Iraq is democracy, they can, they can choose their leaders, they have them. No, that's not correct. That, that this, this, this isn't applicable in our, in our situation. The only way that Iraq is going to be able to move forward is to have that Iranian chokehold and its puppets removed. Once that's done, then you're able to do proper elections. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even trust the system then. I would ask for the United Nations to come in. They need to do the, the, uh, the elections. It needs to be well monitored and verified. And then we can come up with a proper uh, uh, representation uh, at that time. So if I understand you correctly, the aims of the protesters are to have the Iranian influencer leave the country. Yeah. Um, so my question is how uh, well articulated is that by the protesters and uh, what are the, what's the degree of hope that that's achievable? Um, so if, um, if I listen to the, the, the chants in the protests during the protests in the last month, uh, they're consistent. So get rid of Iran, that's immediate. We will not accept any of the leaders at the moment nor their parties, and that's consistent across the country. And to put down, uh, to put a foot down on corruption and regain all the money back that has been lost. And that, those are the three. So those three would then enable the country to come out of this, this uh, cycle. Uh, it would start, it would kick in uh, the infrastructure, uh, rebuilding of the entire country, which then kicks in employment and employment opportunities, which then kicks in uh, entrepreneurships, which then kicks in. Well, all, so the cycle then starts to, to, to roll. You see what I mean? Well, that's, um, I, I, I love the articulate. Right, it's a lot. And um, yes, but the, the, the thing is, because of all the promises since 2003 up to now, nothing has changed. They're not letting go. And it's constant. They will not move until things change. Now, it's a stalemate at the moment because they've taken over now three out of the, I think, five or six uh, main bridges uh, of Baghdad, separating the, the sort of the, the east and the west parts of Baghdad. Um, and they're just across the bridge. So the main bridge that they're holding on is right next to where the, the, the green zone is. Um, and that's where the government is. And that's of course where the, where the US embassy is as well. So they're standing still there and they want to move, but they know that the, 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 the extra steps that they may take across the bridge could result in more casualties, much more casualties. I think if they attempt, I think they know that they're, they're at a stalemate at the moment and they're holding the fronts, but if they move closer, um, then the government or Iran itself would then take drastic measures to quell it. And that would mean hundreds, if not thousands of uh, lives lost. And these are kids. These are like teens and, and kids. They're, they're really, I mean, the pictures that, I, that I'm getting, the videos that I'm getting are just teenagers with their heads blown off. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a massacre, you know? And you, you, you come back to, to the double standards. So, Saddam Hussein, for example, was executed because of the massacre that he did of 148 uh, Shiites in a city called Bijay because they tried an assassination attempt against him. So he, he went back and, and that was his revenge. And so he was executed on that. So the court proceedings and all that was based on that particular thing. So far, we've had 500, if not more, deaths. That's not including the kidnappings that we don't know about 
the tortures and things like that, and about 15,000 injured so far. Yet nothing has been said about it anywhere. And this is in a capital in the heart of the city, and nothing has been said about it anywhere. So just double standards again on that. Well, this is th that was it for my questions, and um, this has been extremely uh, helpful for our work, and I, I would say interesting for me personally. Um, I'm wondering through email if you could send some of the links to some of these pictures, however graphic. I can, and, yeah. um, I can tag you. I can tag you to multiple um, uh, uh, pictures on on uh, on Facebook if you want. If you want to add me on that Facebook, that would be great. I'll, Yes, I'll add, um, I'll add you personally, and then I'll see that Code Pink is, sure. is following yes. you fully um, as yeah. well. And I don't know if you're on Twitter. Uh, I am, but uh, not as frequent, uh, not tweeting as frequent as I should. But uh, I will look yeah. for you there and then lift up what you do and um, both Code Pink and, and my own and Medea and Jody's accounts. Yeah, I think, Ariel, uh, one of the questions that um, Jody asked was, uh, what can the U.S. help with? So if my message, my message would be then to, to Donald Trump or the government or whoever, if the elections in 2020 change, um, uh, the, you know, whoever comes in. Um, if, I, if I sum this up in a few points, uh, I think the Iraqis need to have the legitimacy of the current government uh, taken away, stripped away. And this, this can be done by the U.S. government and its allies. And of course, the U.S. is always the, the for, you know, in the forefront of uh, any of these. So whether it's going through war or looking at all of our alternatives, Europe, for example, and, the, and Great Britain would follow uh, suit when that comes in. So this taking away the, the, the legitimacy of the, the current Iraqi government based on the atrocities that have happened, based on the corruption that's nonstop, that, that hasn't uh, uh, changed since 2003, uh, that should be something, uh, it should be a piece of cake. And then that then starts the, the uh, 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 let's say, the, the crumbling of, of the entire structure that Iran holds so dear in Iraq. And then I'm hearing from you as well that uh, media coverage is media very, yeah. very needed. And that's something that we as Code Pink can start to work on. Uh, we yes. can do some petitioning to some of the media outlets and say, why aren't you covering this? Especially- because I, I, know, I know you guys don't want war in Iran, but at the same time, I'm sure you guys don't want the same regime because you can see, I mean, five days ago, the, the protest started. We don't know how many because it's such a closed system. We don't know how many deaths have already started. We don't know what the what the uh, the Iranian regime is doing now to the people and how. We, know far it's not, we, we assume it's not good, and what we've heard is that it's not good. And uh, human right, uh, sorry, Amnesty released yesterday that by their calculations, around two hundred dead at least. Yeah. Um, no, we don't want war with Iran, and we also want accountability for the U.S. war with Iraq. And uh, what's happening right now is following that The Intercept just revealed, um, you yeah, know, all of this information yeah. about the U.S.'s role. And so yeah. it should be then, we should be highlighting, yes, these are the after effects. These are the effects and this is what it looks like and this is what's happening on the ground because of what the U.S. did. Um, because of the blunder in 2003. So like one thing we can do as Code Pink is we can petition media outlets to be covering both this story and of course the protests in Iran, of course they should be covered. Um, and there, you know, we also see what's happening in Iran right now and uh, within the Iranian government that because of US sanctions, because of US threats of war, the hardliners there are actually are being emboldened. And so, you know, we're, the U.S. is causing the worst aspects of the Iranian regime to increase in power. So, you know, we have, we have a nuanced um, position. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to touch on as well is there needs to be a referendum, a, a referendum of the Constitution, the Constitution at the moment, or rewriting of the Constitution. The Iraqis at the moment are not happy with Bremer's Constitution. And this is an important point that needs to be addressed because the constitution um, has all sorts of flaws and uh, has created all sorts of problems. And part of which is 
has given the the uh, legitimacy of this this government to take hold and to do what it wants to do and has been doing all this time. So the constitution is a very important part of this. Um, I, the the from my point of view, there needs to be uh, UN inspections, uh, sorry UN inspectors coming in to look at the atrocities that have been committed by uh, the government. So it will be an independent investigation that goes through what has happened, who was involved, and pointing the fingers, and then bringing in the, I mean, bring, putting in accountability into it. So bringing in the perpetrators, uh, making sure that they pay the price for the, the atroc atrocities that uh, have been committed. So either by signing off from the government, certain people have signed off OKs on snipers to kill, or was it, was it you know, uh, done directly with, from the Iranians to make sure whoever has been responsible, whoever has been captured, whoever has been uh, held, there, there needs to be done. Uh, I, and I, can, I can't trust the Iraqis to do so. Uh, it'll be inf infiltrated, it'll, it'll go haywire, and we'll never get to the bottom of it. And, and the, all the Iraqis will agree with that. So a UN investigation needs to be done. It needs to be done in a thorough manner. There also needs to be some sort of UN peacekeeping forces because we still have um, militias running around, abducting, killing, assassinating, controlling all sorts of parts of the, of the country. The militias at the moment control a large part of uh, some of the areas, uh, some of the Sunni areas. So for example, Mosul, uh, Ramadi and all those. And they're, they're not allowing displaced persons who have left five, six years ago now even maybe more, uh, have not been able to return back to their homes uh, uh, because of it. And it's a displacement process that, uh, uh, that the, the Iranians have been pursuing ever since. So you displace them, you try to get them uh, uh, to just give up and move on, and maybe hopefully they move to a different country and so on. And then you demographically change what Iraq used to be to what it would, a, new, a completely new Iraq at the moment. So that's, that's a very important thing as well. And the US can also help, and this is something that I know Iraqis will, um, will look very favorably in, in, in terms of how the US is helping, by giving extradition to all corrupt Iraqis who are living in the States, who have dual nationalities, for example, or in Europe, and so on and so forth. Now, when America wants to do something and wants to get people, it does that. And it does that very well. It has to then support the people, the Iraqis, regaining the 1.5 trillion now, 1.5 trillion dollars that have been uh, taken out, uh, because we need this money to, to, to rebuild the country and to give a future. And it does make it makes no sense because I, I see this all the time, and it's on social media. Our uh, our uh, uh, previous uh, minister of electricity uh, who stole 18 million dollars is sitting uh, because he's got uh, dual nationality American and Iraqi nationality is sitting in America uh, enjoying his his money there this makes no sense so many politicians Iraqi politicians are millionaires now when they had when they were living on welfare in England now they're millionaires with all sorts of properties and income how did they get all of this and who's going to put those uh, you know, accountability, and we need those those people extradited back to Iraq to go through the proper legal uh, procedures and get the money back from the banks and uh, you know the 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 institutions that that are holding Iraq's actual money, Iraq's stolen money. So this these are these are very very important things. So the U.S. is able to help in supporting. The Iraqis and bringing about change in these manners. We certainly can't guarantee that the U.S. government will help. We have a lot of accountability that the U.S. government should be giving to its own citizens as well right now. But we can tell you that as Code Pink, we will work on accountability from the U.S. people and pressuring our government. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for speaking with me. This has been Fascinating. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you very much for the time, to be honest. And uh, we'll be in touch and we'll be, I'll be following you on social media myself and Code Pink will be watching closely. And yeah, please keep us updated as well. Anything that comes up in any ways we can assist. 
uh, that that will be great. Any help is is really really appreciated. I really we really need to do something. Uh, there are lives being lost all over all over the world, but a lot of it, a lot of the problems are in this particular area in, in the Middle East. And and now's the moment. Course, now's right? a moment that there's some openings. So yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get to work on it. Very good. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.